Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to begin this Earth Day Forum, uh, which is an event convened by the Canadian Partnership for International Justice, together with the Stop Ecoside Foundation and Stop Ecoside Canada. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Lisa Aldring. I'm a legal advisor to Stop Ecoside Canada. And as I look out on a very snowy uh, landscape, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Treaty 7 territory and the traditional lands of the Stony Nakoda, Blackfoot and Sutina First Nations. For those that are not familiar with Stop Ecoside Canada, we're part of a global campaign, Stop Ecoside International, which was co-founded by Jojo Meta, together with the late Polly Higgins. The singular aim of this global campaign is to establish a law of ecocide, which would recognize large scale and systematic destruction of nature as an international crime. And this would be enshrined in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Our aim with Stop Ecocide Canada is to build support and ensure that Canada's stated commitment to being a world leader for the climate includes making ecocide an international crime. I'm especially pleased, I'm thrilled to be co-moderating this event together with the fabulous Professor Fanny Lafontaine, who I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for over many years. Among her many impressive hats, Fanny is a professor at the Faculté de Droit at Université Laval. She's also the co-founder and director of the Canadian Partnership for International Justice. She holds the Canada Research Chair on International criminal justice uh, and human rights. And she's also the founder and co-director of the International Criminal and Humanitarian Law Clinic. Fanny will take us through the program and will present our incredible panelists shortly. So just briefly, the idea behind today's event is to mark Earth Day by generating a discussion of this concept of ecocide as an international crime, especially with the legal and civil society communities in Canada and around the world. We hope to raise awareness through a conversation that will build bridges between the disciplines with participation of environmental lawyers, indigenous activists, uh, advocates, international criminal law experts, human rights, gender advocates, policymakers, and so on. This really needs to be an inclusive space for discussion. Today's event will be what we hope uh, the first in a series uh, that we will co-host together as we couldn't possibly cover everything today. So we hope that you will join us for the full series of, of discussions as we take this forward. Um, before we introduce our panelists, I would really like to thank our amazing team of behind the scene organizers, uh, especially at the CPIJ and Université Laval. Uh, thank you, Eric, and a whole team of colleagues um, who've also made sure that we have simultaneous interpretation for this event. So participants should feel free to ask questions through the chat uh, Q&A function, either in French or in English, however you're comfortable. So I'll now invite Fanny to say a few words and to introduce our panelists. Over to you, Fanny. Merci, Lisa. Bonjour. Thank you, Lisa. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello to all of those who have joined us from several countries everywhere in the world. As Lisa said, you can choose your language, English or French, by pushing the interpretation button, the globe at the bottom. We promise that next time we'll try to have Spanish interpretation. We received a lot of requests from our friends and colleagues from Latin America in particular, who would have liked this language to be included. We didn't have enough time to do this. Uh, welcome to all you who come from everywhere. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. I uh, thank and acknowledge the team who's organized this, Eric and Melanie. I thank them. I'm a professor at, the, at Laval University, so I'm speaking to you directly from the wonderful city of Quebec City on the territory of the huron wendat Nation, which I salute, and I salute the work of all uh, Indigenous communities. Uh, who, which are essentials for the protection of territories and ecosystems. And that will be a topic that will be the topic of large discussions in future with our uh, collaboration within the Stop Ecocide Foundation. The format of this conference is pretty simple. We will first give the floor for a few minutes to our three wonderful speakers.
speakers, which I will introduce quickly. And then Lisa and I will manage a question period. We want this to be an interactive discussion between our speakers. And maybe Lisa and I, we will give ourselves the privilege of intervening and speaking. And then we will give you the floor, dear participants on Zoom. We will allow you to ask questions. You will be able to use the chat box to do so. And to do that, we'll try to find a way to answer most of the questions. We will allow you to ask questions to our panelists so that you have a discussion that will be as open as possible. So let me quickly introduce our panelists. And I will do this very quickly because we want to hear about the topic. You'll find the bios of the panelists in the chat box, the full bios, because we have very important people with us. First of all, Jojo Mida. Privilege. So Jojo is the uh, co-founder, uh, as you mentioned, Lisa, of the Stop Ecocide campaign, but she also coordinates the international campaign uh, and also is the chair of the board of the Stop Ecocide Foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, she's the convener of the uh, independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide, uh, which uh, is going to be one of the topic of our discussion. So welcome, Jojo, and I will briefly introduce the two others, so and then we can get on with our fun today and talk about uh, the, the stuff we're here to, to talk about. Our second speaker is Daryl Robinson, my good friend. Hello, Daryl. He's a part of our partnership, the Canadian Partnership for International Justice. He's a professor at Queen's University. University uh, Faculty of Law. Uh, he worked for the creation of the International Criminal Court and he's won awards for this. Uh, uh, he also worked at the International Criminal Court for quite some time as an expert on international criminal law. It's a real privilege to have you here, Daryl. Thank you so much. And notre dernier, je suis désolé de faire le switch français anglais, mais voilà. And our last speaker, I'm sorry to do the switch between French and English, but we're in Canada, at least. We are. <laughs> Hello, Giro. Hi, Giro. Giro is a professor and my colleague at Laval University at the Faculty of Law, where he teaches environmental law and the climate change law. He is also a scientific advisor for the International Network of Climate Students. We we're very happy to have you with us, Jérôme, because it might be the big challenge of creating the crime of ecocide, as Lisa mentioned, is to put, in, to put together the various disciplines, people who work on different topics in different sectors of IGD. So we're really happy to have experts in criminal law, but also in environmental law, to create a synergy of discussions towards a common objective to protect the environment. So welcome to all. And without further ado, I give the floor to Jojo. Thank you. It's fantastic to be with you today. Um, and I would like to start actually just by honoring uh, Polly Higgins, because it's two years exactly yesterday, in fact, since she departed this life. And we co-founded the Stop Ecoside campaign together in 2017, um, by which time Polly had already spent seven years um, crusading for the recognition of ecocide as an international crime. And I spent the last four and a half years of her life working closely with her. Um, and this brings us to the, the core of, of this work, which is that it's a very, very precise campaign. It campaigns for something that we kind of think of as a strategic intervention, almost like an acupuncture needle um, in terms of the, the kind of impact that we hope this can create. And that is to criminalize ecocide at the international level, specifically at the International Criminal Court. Um, and it's probably worth just giving um, a couple of key indicators as to why we pursue that particular route. Um, and the first is a kind of practical legal one, I suppose, in the sense that the ICC is, is unique in the fact that it's the only global mechanism which directly accesses the criminal justice systems of all its member states. There is no other global mechanism that does that in that way. Um, and so if you create a crime at the International Criminal Court, um, then any member state that ratifies that crime must include it in its own domestic legislation. And so it creates the possibility of a coherence across borders and across jurisdictions, which is particularly important with serious environmental crime because the worst offenders are transnational corporations and their supply chains. And so being able to um, create a, a law which has a coherence across boundaries is very important because those companies are perfectly capable of jurisdiction hopping according to where the laws are more lenient and so forth. So that's a, a first and, and very practical reason. The second reason is, is more political. Um, and that is something that um, we can actually, uh, my point is observable right now in France. Um, and it is this, that 
legislating for ecocide as a nation, you, sort of on one's own, can make a government feel a little nervous. It's quite scary, the idea of being the first on the block, or, um, I mean, of course, there are some jurisdictions that have ecocide in their, in their penal codes already, but hasn't re haven't really used it. Um, and for any major economy right now to decide to do that on its own is quite a scary prospect because of established economic relationships and the fact that when you bring in national legislation, that can happen quite quickly. What we want to do with this law is bring everybody with us. We're in a global emergency here, climate-wise, biodiversity-wise, in terms of uh, an ecological emergency. And it's not going to cut it if some people want to go forward and others want to hold back. This is very much a campaign where we want to bring the whole world with us. And what that requires is some time, not too much time. We don't have too much time, but a little time, because the corporate sector and the politicians all need to get their heads around this and start looking at things like transition policies, compliance pathways, all of that kind of thing. Um, and so to aim at the International Criminal Court is actually politically quite a sensible thing to do because it's politically easier and safer for a government to support an international crime of ecocide. It means that they can put their cards on the table about going in the right direction, look great doing it, and at the same time know that they don't have to act from one day to the next but also know that once many other countries stand with them, that this can move forward together with everybody working together. And so there's safety in numbers. And of course, from our perspective, that's also the most practical because that's what we want. We actually want the whole world to be moving together on this. So that's quite a, quite a strong political reason. And the reason I say that it's playing out, that that, that, that point is being played out in France right now is that France is, is the first country to say that they want to leg legislate internationally, but also to, to do so nationally um, in recent months. And that's been driven quite strongly by um, grassroots pressure at the, at the public level, which is incredibly important, and I'll return to that. Um, but what they're finding is that legislating nationally and rapidly is actually quite difficult and, and creates a lot of resistance. And so the, the definition that they've been working with in, at the government level in France has been considerably watered down in order to try and sort of address that, um, which, you know, we feel is, is you know, is, is problematic. Um, and, and we think that the, the political reason is very much as I've just outlined. And then the third reason, um, which may in the end turn out to be the most important one, is that by criminalizing ecocide at the highest level, what we are saying is that serious destruction of ecosystems and of the natural living world is as bad as destroying people, is as bad as destroying property. And that is a very important kind of development to push for. And that is because our current legal system is hugely anthropocentric and focused on property. Um, and that in itself drives from a, you know, centuries old a tradition of separating, you know, mind from body, spirit from nature, um, you know, all, all of these kind of dualisms that, that run through Western thinking and Western education um, and that have a kind of create a sense of separation and, it, you know, in, in the worst cases, superiority, colonialism and all of that sort of stems from that same kind of stream, if you like, um, that, that runs through Western thinking. Um, and so to which is why I also referred, referred to it earlier as a sort of strategic intervention. Placing this crime alongside genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity has the capacity to really quite seriously shift that perception. Because in the dominant global sort of Western paradigm of thinking, the one that is dominating so much of the world, we actually use criminal law to help draw the moral lines. So, you know, you know, you can't go to a government and ask for permission to slaughter a few hundred people for your next business. Yeah, that's that's criminally unacceptable and it's morally unacceptable. But currently, some of the industrial activities that at their worst lead to ecocide are not only permitted, they're licensed. Um, and so there's there's a very strong difference in perception. So we believe that this has the this has the potential to shift that perception. Um, and to bring into play the fact that the, the, the reality, it really is a factual reality, that we are deeply intertwined with the ecosystems that sustain us. 
And of course, the indigenous voices with, who, with whom we are communicating more and more recently understand this profoundly. I've always understood this. Um, and so there's a potential there for a major shift. And the other thing that we believe that this, uh, this sort of shift at the top level has the capacity to do is to help with shifting the perception around the enforcement of environment, environmental regulation, which is already in place. Because one of the big problems with um, serious destruction of nature around the world is not so much the absence of law, although there is absence of law, it's actually very weak enforcement of environmental law that is in place, um, both regulate, regulatory and where there are crimes that exist uh, with, with environmental criminal law. And we believe that this is in large part because of this way that we, we see in the, in the Western stream of thinking, we see nature as being something to dominate, something to extract from uh, a resource bank and not therefore in the same moral bracket. And so what we hope and trust is that once this is adopted at the international level, we will actually see a sort of cascading effect on environmental law generally. And we will see a, a, an enhanced enforcement of environmental regulation and also probably quite a large growth in areas like reporting, investigation, compliance, and all of those associated areas, which currently are not hugely developed, including the training of legal people, um, lawyers, judges, um, and so on, in, in terms of dealing with environmental crime. So that gives you a kind of um, very broad background on why it is that we particularly choose this route to follow. I'll now give you a little update on where we've got to. Um, and, uh, and I have to say, things are moving incredibly fast right now. When Polly and I first began this campaign, we partly um, began it to uh, support activists on the ground and also partly it to uh, crowdfund for the diplomatic work. Because at the time, foundation funding was very difficult to find for this particular kind of work. It was seen as quite left field, a bit extreme and also when what you're doing depends on um, effectively ultimately the result depends on what states do rather than what the campaign does that's you know obviously a risk in terms of supporting that financially and of course you also have the interesting situation where if your your progress happens behind closed doors in diplomatic meetings it's very difficult to sort of stand up with a funding pitch and say well here are my milestones when oh actually I can't tell you about those because they're confidential um, so <laughs> the the origin of this campaign in, in terms of the public facing originally came from this sense that well the public understand this you know that Polly had a really quite a strong international following already and it was this sense that actually at the grassroots level there's a very intuitive understanding that serious crime to nature should be criminalized and so that's where we, we, we went with the campaign and we realized that although um, you know perhaps at grassroots level and, they were, and I'm sure that, you know, you, you will all have encountered this. Often, if you're not a lawyer or you don't work in law, law is something over there that lawyers do. And criminal law is probably even further. And international criminal law might as well be on the moon. But what we have found over the last three and a bit years is that actually that connection between the public facing campaign and the work at the diplomatic level and the legal level developing things are actually much more closely related than we originally thought. Because what we found is that where we have communication teams on the ground, and we have a fantastic one in Canada, and I know that we've got quite a few of them here in this audience, um, where we have communication teams on the ground, the political dial is also getting pushed faster. And it's quite clear, because where we have those teams, that network maps really quite well onto the list of states that are now publicly recording an interest in this discussion um, and where the parliamentarians are getting in touch with us and saying we'd quite like to see that definition when that emerges in June please. So effectively that that what that is very encouraging and very empowering because what it means is that where the conversation is happening on the ground in the particular culture in a particular language that is also hitting the radars of politicians and one of the reasons for that we believe is actually encapsulated in the word and the concept itself because I believe most people now have a very strong sense that serious damage is happening to nature in many different arenas. Um, and the word ecocide somehow brings all of that together. It says this is all serious damage and destruction. Um, and of course, as soon as you understand that, you also understand that you want, you want to stop it or you want someone to stop it. Um, and so there's a kind of natural traction within the concept, which we're finding is, is, is very much helping in terms of um, kind of sp spreading the, the, the word around this, literally the word uh, and the concept and, and, and 
as I say, pushing the pushing the dial politically. So that that is actually very exciting. And we now have um, eight ICC member states with a publicly recorded interest in this conversation in various different levels. Um, and parliamentarians from a further, I think it's 16 countries now at least, um, uh, who are you know, eagerly awaiting the definition which will emerge from the legal drafting panel in June. Um, and so that's, that's very encouraging. And I think it, the, the last thing I'd like to sort of leave you with is the fact that, that this is now kind of grown beyond uh, the Stop Eagles Eye Foundation trying to publicize itself if you like, you know, we're effectively in a position where we're, we're in between the legal developments, obviously, with the convening of this panel, chaired by Philippe Sands and Dior Farceau, also the diplomatic traction in terms of building connections with a, a group of interested states to potentially take this forward, but also with the public narrative. And what that, that, that position is an interesting one to be in because, you know, it allows us to communicate in all of those areas and, and to help sort of move this conversation forward in various different ways. And so that's very exciting. And in recent months, we've had, you know, an, another kind of jump in attention in a sense because of, you know, the, the, this, this panel that's working on the definition um, and the fact that, uh, you know, this is now being picked up in more in the mainstream. So in terms of mainstream media and and I would just like to, to finish with saying that there's um, an, again another poignant moment that's happening right now in that uh, you may recall that Extinction Rebellion ha ha had a, a, a massive action in April of 2019 around Easter and that Polly Higgins spent the last week of her life um, following the developments of that rebellion in London and right now in the court in London, the activists who kicked off that rebellion at the Shell headquarters in, in London um, did that and dedicated it to Polly. They are currently, uh, they've just gone through their trial and the jury is out as I speak to find out whether or not they're going to be considered guilty or not guilty of the criminal damage that they committed. Um, so this is, um, this is, this is really a, a, a poignant moment because that last week of Polly's life was the first week that she saw what she had campaigned for for so many years, Stop Ecocide, actually hitting the streets on placards across London. And that rebellion and also, you know, as well as Greta Thunberg's school strikes, the Sunrise Movement and the other kind of climate mobilizations that we've seen have done an incredible job at opening the window of conversation in the media and in politics so that what Polly was saying for years is now finally being heard and many, many more voices are joining that movement so that the last couple of years has felt like a gigantic dot joining exercise and that's brought, brought us ultimately to this conversation now and it's such a delight to be with you all so thank you for listening thank you so much jojo uh, you really helped uh, i think bring us all onto the same page and understand where uh where the issues are at and set the scenes for us and also remind us of just how urgent the conversation uh, we're having today is um i'd like to invite daryl robinson now to uh deliver his few remarks. Daryl, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess I'm going to talk about um, definition and some uh, technical type questions. Um, uh, first of all, though, I'll say I've had conversations with environmental lawyers who are uh, skeptical of ecocide. So I'll acknowledge uh, and address one of their arguments against uh, criminal law. Um, so, uh, yeah, some environmentalists say, listen, like uh, you international criminal lawyers, you're holding a hammer and everything to you looks like a nail that um, uh, dealing with climate change is going to be a complex process involving lots of systematic societal reforms. There's going to be trade offs. Criminal law is crude. Um, and I, I agree that's all true. But why is it still useful to have criminal law involved? And I think it's because of the expressive function of criminal law, the educative function. Uh, Jojo talked about shifting perceptions, and I think that's exactly the reason why ecocide is important. At the moment, environmental damage is considered regulatory. It's a lesser um, matter. Uh, so criminal law is more serious, regulatory is below. If someone uh, pees on a street, that's crime. Uh, but if you flood a city with toxic metals, um, injuring everyone in the city, that's uh, usually not really addressed, right? So, and this is backwards. So the main uh, message is, uh, the main message of this is to 
uh, make companies who are considering a harmful mega project just pause and really, really think, right? So changing that perspective that if you're destroying this little habitat that all humans and all life need, that is actually one of the most serious uh, crimes. Um, and I agree with Jojo as well about the idea of a cascade effect. Just because we have ecocide doesn't mean it's going to uh, give less attention to lesser environmental um, offenses. If anything, I think it will help uh, create that shift. Um, I'll say a word about forum too. Uh, we're right now focused on the International Criminal Court because that's what states are looking at and that's the vehicle. So I think it's worth uh, doing for the reasons Jojo gave. I will share with you my own, my own agenda is uh, I would like to follow it up with a multilateral treaty. Um, we have multilateral treaties criminalizing all kinds of things, including cutting submarine cables. How about destroying the planet could be, you know, up there with cutting submarine uh, 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 cables. So, um, and why is that? International Criminal Court, it's just one jurisdiction. It's overwhelmed as it is. Uh, they might actually, in practical terms, do one ecocide case a decade, um, and then it will could very well lead to acquittal because that seems to be their track record. <laughs> Not that acquittals are wrong, but you know, they're, the court is struggling. Um, so if, it, if we also had a, an environmental treaty with 160 states and all their national courts having this crime, I think that could have a really big effect. Other benefits of a treaty is the ICC has Article 30, which is quite narrow with respect to intent and knowledge, but environmental crimes involve recklessness and negligence a lot, so we need those. Um, the International Criminal Court doesn't look at corporations as such, um, but it could look at the board of directors of a corporation, so that's okay. But um, uh, in a treaty would be easy to cover corporate liability. And then another reason why I like a separate treaty is uh, I picture a treaty could cover other things. So ecocide could be the centerpiece, but there are things that are short of ecocide that maybe we need to urge states to do more of. So um, I don't know if ecocide will include criminal negligence. It might not because of the fault, but then we could have that a negligence crime. Another one that's in my mind a lot, which I'll share with you just for 30 seconds is uh, climate disinformation. Um, I think climate disinformation or carbon fraud or whatever we want to call it, I think it's one of the biggest crimes um, of this uh, century. Um, and probably a lot of people here know this, but Exxon, for example, knew that global warming was happening and yet they deliberately sowed doubt in the public discourse successfully delaying actions by humans to avert a global disaster. To me, that's, that's, a, that's, one, of the, that's one of the most inc inconceivably big crimes I can imagine. They successfully stopped firefighters from getting to the, to the, to the fire, right? So I, I would like to see something, uh, some, something to do with climate disinformation or, or fraud in reporting um, and, and so on. But anyways, let's get back to the eco side. So uh, what are some issues? Um, ecocide is easy to, to say what we want. We want to cover the worst pollution and the worst emitters. It's actually really, really hard to define. In 1998, when we made the Rome Statute, we looked at humanitarian law and human rights law, and we, we took the worst prohibitions and then we criminalized them. Um, so I thought with ecocide, it would be the same job. So we open up environmental law looking for the prohibitions. There aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> environmental law says states will take this into account, states will give due consideration to this, states are going to make an action plan. Um, there's uh, uh, caps and trading systems, not prohibitions, just like, uh, um, oh, uh, developing countries have common but differentiated responsibilities, which makes sense, but it, it's just everything is really loosey-goosey uh, loosey in environmental law, even the ones that are famous, like uh, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, CFCs, we banned. But then when I looked at it, uh, it has exceptions, phase outs. It, there's not much in the way of hard prohibition. So that's challenge number one is what is the prohibited thing? It turns out environmental law itself is all about balancing of things. So uh, what do we do? Another issue is what's the threshold going to be? Obviously the threshold shouldn't be so high that the crime is unworkable, but um, figuring out the right threshold, it's going to be a not a one-dimensional equation, but a two-dimension, um, because we want the best definition we can get that also gives lots of state support, right? So that um, it's, it's how good is your definition multiplied by how many states do you have, right? Which will give you the biggest 
I'm, I'm picturing, are you see what I'm doing here? I'm drawing this graph, right? And I'm trying to maximize the area that's going to get the big, the big impact. So um, yeah, and it's a tragic thing, but in the world we're in right now, states are the gatekeepers. So it's got to be something, we define something so terrible that states will say, yeah, that's, that's bad. And there's a lot of terrible things happening. So if we could criminalize terrible stuff, that would actually have a big impact in the world. So um, where do we look for our definitions? Um, there's different attempts to define genocide out there, uh, ecocide out there. Uh, one was uh, by a guy named Falk. His was intent to destroy an ecosystem. That might be too narrow because that intent to destroy, that would require someone has the purpose of destroying an ecosystem or at the ICC would require knowledge of certainty of destroying an ecosystem. And that might be too um, rare because typically in the environment gets harmed as a byproduct. Someone's pursuing profit and they're just right. So it, intent might be the wrong idea. Another interesting one was, I'm not sure the pronunciation, I don't, I don't know, but they talk about planetary boundaries, doing a harm that pushes the earth beyond its capacities. That's kind of interesting. Um, and the downsides of that one would be, um, that might be hard to prove in a criminal law setting. And also, um, I see these harms as they're an accumulation of things. It's hard to find the one guy who pushed the earth over the tipping point. So I'm not sure about the planetary boundaries. Um, the, my two favorites, one is Polly Higgins. Uh, it talks about uh, disrupting the peaceful enjoyment of something by inhabitants. That's, I think, pretty good. And the International Law Commission talks about doing widespread long-term and severe uh, damage to the environment. Um, I find both of those are more uh, concrete and more, more uh, easily applied. Um, okay, I got two minutes left, but that's okay. I think I'm kind of done. Um, so uh, I guess I'll say, um, you know, some issues to figure out is, um, I think the three ingredients of ecocide, there's gonna be an impact threshold. How much impact is needed to make this crime of international concern? There's going to be a fault standard. What's the mens rea going to be? Um, and the fault might be, it, some people would say intent. I'm a little worried for the reasons I gave that intent might be too narrow. I don't think people intend to destroy the environment. Maybe negligence makes sense. Uh, or will states find that too uh, uh, inclusive? And in between the two is knowledge. Um, doing something with the knowledge that it's likely to cause harm, which is my personal favorite. Um, oh, um, mm, oh yeah, I'm still good. I got one minute and 20 seconds left. Uh, so, um, <laughs> um, greenhouse gases, should that be included carbon? I think, yes. I think, uh, uh, carbon emissions is, you know, climate change is one of the biggest problems facing the world. It has to be included. The difficult part is figuring out when is an emission criminal. So, um, that's really tough. Um, and lastly, I suspect the third ingredient is somehow ecocide has to tap into environmental principles. Um, uh, like um, the polluter praise principle, the precautionary principle. Um, the reason for saying that is picture two companies. Let, let's, let's take greenhouse gases. Let's picture two companies. Company A, they're emitting more carbon, uh, CO2 into the air, but they're, they're running, they're operating airplanes. It's socially beneficial and they're doing all measures possible to keep their uh, uh, emissions down. That's company A. Company B has lower emissions, but they are wasteful. They're, they've corrupted the domestic system. They're, they've got an unnecessary carbon intensive project. They're making no efforts to mitigate. I want to go after company B, but anyways, that's one thing to discuss. So those are the ecocide necessary and difficult to define. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl. This, this puts a lot of questions into, and we have already a lot of questions in the chat and we'll certainly come back to the definition. Uh, and there's questions of forum you mentioned, you know, International Criminal Court, yes, but shouldn't we create a new international tribunal? Should we create a separate treaty? You mentioned all the advantages, possible advantages, that's interesting. And what acts could be then, and what's the intent? Is that intent, is it, and you mentioned recklessness, would it be willful blindness? Is that enough? And it's, this is criminal law geek stuff, but uh, we. We are some of us so um after we let the floor to uh, one of our best criminal law geek i'll uh, pass the floor to one of our best environmental law geeks so Jero, la parole est à toi. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Fanny et Elisa pour, um, pour cette invitation. thank you very much fanny and 
Lisa for this invitation. I'm very happy to join this discussion. I'll try to formulate a few brief remarks about ecocide as an international crime, but that will be based on a perspective that is slightly different compared to the previous interventions, because I'm not an expert in uh, criminal international environmental law. I am not a specialist of the crime of ecocide. My fields are environmental law and climate change law, rather. And curiously enough, even if this uh, crime of ecocide concerns the environment, the ecocide is not part of the notions with which we're used to working uh, in environmental law. Uh, creation of an ecocide crime is not a question that was the heart of the discussions that the states have as part of the international environmental agreements during the big diplomatic conferences. And so far, I have the impression it's mostly criminal law specialists who were interested in this question. And I would say that personally, I'm very happy to take part in this event because not being a criminal law specialist, I'm learning a lot of things. I'm sure I will learn even more. So in this presentation, I will simply share with you a few general observations which we can make on this crime of ecocide when we look at this notion, as we started doing, under the angle of the environmental problem, problem of climate change, which obviously is a problem to which it's difficult not to think about when we think about ecocide. And I will limit myself to three comments. First thing, from the point of view of international law on climate change, the recognition of an international crime of ecocide will, will fill an obvious gap because as we started saying in its current form, uh, the international rules that were put in place to fight against climate change don't allow us to morally sanction or penally sanction physical people, physical persons, uh, business leaders, political uh, people, or businesses themselves who are ne ne neglectful or negligent with their greenhouse emissions, or uh, encourage climaticide projects, as we call them. This is part of the Paris Agreement. Those are instruments that are made by the states for the states and don't concern directly uh, the, to, to uh, rule the behavior of the individual and the ideas of sanctions and repression are totally uh, foreign to those treaties. It's strictly uh, accountability mechanisms in the Paris Treaty are not criminal, but just accusatory. Instead of repressing or sanctioning, well, this international law on climate change is based on incentives and negotiations. So there's nothing in this climate change international law that will allow us to dissuade uh, uh, through penal perspectives, any economic operators or political uh, people in charge uh, for issuing or permitting or allowing the emission of greenhouse gas. I think this recognition of a crime of ecocide will fill this gap, which I think is not just a gap uh, in terms of legal technical aspects and tools, but it's also more fundamentally a gap for the credibility of environmental law as a problem solving instrument of environmental issues. So what I mean, it's been 25 years that we negotiated climate rules and we get to results uh, as an understatement. Let's say those results are really limited. That's an understatement. And it's so important, it's too severe so that the only response should be a response based on incentives, negotiation and, and respect of national sovereignties. So international law, as long as international law has not defined a founding prohibition to take the impression from um, Professor Maras Marty, we can say that this international law will not have uh, taken this seriously. So from this point of view, recognizing a crime of ecocide that could sanction behaviors that are prejudicial to the system had uh, would have a real added value and that would represent a real progress forward. This said, we should first get a certain consensus that the most prejudicial uh, crimes against uh, climate change are an evil fact that is unacceptable and that is uh, to be sanctioned by the international community. I don't know if this consensus exists now, but that, that's what we have seen for a few years, although, and that's my second comment, we see a discourse coming to the fore that aims to promote and have this idea accepted that uh, sustainable uh, uh, prejudice to climate change are a crime, and this goes to the discourse of climate change and fundamental rights. On the one side, we see there's a lot of international treaties in human rights who today recognize that the fact of not acting sufficiently against climate change is a, is a crime against fundamental uh, rights, and there are many jurisdictions, national and subnational, that are solicited, and we ask them to come to this conclusion and to recognize a right to life 
uh, uh, which in involves um, um, uh, cl uh, stable climate change. This is what we hear not here with the Sophie Mathieu um, case that has just been allowed to go forward, recognizing that not acting against climate change is uh, acting against a right to life is a first way of signaling that these attacks on climate change are not something acceptable. They are unacceptable, unacceptable actually, in this sense, um, uh, climate change crimes based on human rights is a phenomenon that will serve the notion of ecocide and will give some legitimacy to this process and with the idea of in installing appeal sanction for sustainable and uh, durable uh, uh, attacks on climate change and no this discourse is hitting out front a uh, reality which we see internationally emitting greenhouse gas still remains licit it's an activity that is regulated by previous authorizations carbon tariffing systems and limits and thresholds but it remains allowed what uh, the estates are asking is not to emit greenhouse gas but to emit greenhouse gas uh, against the rules that tell you how you can emit greenhouse gas and you see where i'm coming there's a difference between this climate problem and other forms of attacks against the environment such as spills or trafficking in uh, endangered species those facts that are totally considered as socially unacceptable and are already repressed through international law or through national law. Which brings me to my third comment that will be a bit shorter. The climate change law sh shows certain specificities that organizing the repression of crimes against climate change through penal uh, means raise certain questions. Just uh, uh, I'll note two here. The first one is on what should we base ourselves to say that the behavior that can be attributed to a person or to a group of persons caused specifically a grave damage to the climate change system. How can we appreciate the severity of a problem like this? First solution could be to use um, climate change to tell people you've caused important damage because there's a drought, there's a, a big heat waves and so on. But of course we're confronted with the problem of the cost to effect link to counter this and uh, we should have indicative thresholds maybe but the problem is that we know that economic actors are very strong to fragment the system and bypass the regulatory thresholds by uh, fractioning their work and uh, that might not be too effective we should have a standard that would be flexible enough to appreciate severity but that standard is not very easy to determine especially since there is an additional difficulty what happens if we have a business which has emitted a lot of greenhouse gases but is compensating those emissions by planting trees or as this is admitted by the Paris Treaty that buy rights for, to emissions is that something that exonerates you from responsibility or is it part of the determination of the sentence I don't have the answers to those questions and the second point that I wanted to address is the issue of the connection between the status of statute of Rome and the treaty, Paris Treaty if Paris, the Paris Treaty it would be applicable in the sense of Section 21 of the Statute of Rome. We know that the Paris Treaty gives more flexibility to developing countries. So should we take into account that flexibility in the application of the crime of ecocide or the climate change crime? Yeah, so uh, taking into account the nationality and the location of the infraction, maybe there's a more fundamental difficulty that Paris Treaty doesn't prohibit states to emit greenhouse gases. So we by an a contrary interpretation we could change that is permissive and it authorizes the states and businesses to emit greenhouse gases uh, i wonder how we could reconcile this with the repressive aspect of the crime of ecocide i will stop here but my point is to say that there's quite a lot of questions to be asked about how to apply this incrimination to the context of climate change i didn't say those, uh, those uh, that those are insurmountable things but um, those are events on which we have to think seriously because the goal of the game would be to anticipate uh, uh, criticisms and many people will be critical so we'll have to uh, provide answers to those critics thank you Thank you, Giro. Uh, and you really brought points which uh, complement what Daryl and Jojo said, and it demonstrates the whole complexity. The behind the apparent simplicity of the crime of ecocide, there is the concrete and practical uh, complication of implementing it. So, the next part, we there are excellent questions in the chat. Don't worry, don't worry. We will have time to discuss with you. 
uh, because uh, there are very good questions and lots and lots of people want to discuss with you. But before asking you a question, I might want to let you react to what I said. I saw Jojo and Daryl cringing uh, when Jérôme was talking. I will give you the floor in inverse order, Daryl, uh, Jojo, and then Jérôme, just to uh, exchange among yourselves uh, on what was said, and then we will continue. So, uh, Daryl, I see you're ready to jump. Um, so, uh, Roberta asked whether transnational harm should be part of the definition, and uh, that is a well-established principle in environmental and international law, so that might be one of the very plausible ingredients for ecocide. Um, someone else asked, if a plastics company knows it's doing harm, doesn't that meet the definition of intent? And the answer is yes, but intent of the ice so intent as i mentioned it can be direct or indirect direct it's my purpose that's going to be rare indirect at the icc requires knowledge of certainty and they are a little bit excessive on how they understand that so it's tough but yes it's possible um that's why i prefer knowledge of likelihood as a different standard but uh but uh, that's that's right um richard asked uh, what if someone's licensed and that is a really hard question what if they have a license in domestic law um yeah and that's just really hard um Typically, international criminal law doesn't necessarily care if it's licensed. Uh, if Nazi law allows murder, um, we don't care. So that's the first instinct of international criminal law. On the other hand, environmental law has a lot of national regulation. But on the other, other hand, <laughs> we can't just defer to anything the national systems do because they do crazy things. So, um, so that's going to be a, one of the things to be figured out. There has to be some constraint on the ability of national systems because they get corrupted, they're lax, they're not following international law, there has to be some limit. Uh, there was another question about universal jurisdiction and uh, yeah, I think if there was a treaty, uh, it could have some kind of extraterritorial jurisdiction. I hope I've answered enough of the, the questions there, thanks. Well, you're actually quite a rebel, but I, I know that about you, so that's good. We were going to uh, to answer the questions from the audience later on in the, in the chat, so don't worry, you'll have time to have discussions on this. I wanted right. you to, no, I know, I know you, yeah, I know you, you never know listen. You know and... I'm a rebel, I, I live <laughs> exactly. my own way. Um, I love you this way, that's why you're here. But um, but uh, I don't know if, uh, Jojo, you wanted to, uh, to to say anything on what Daryl or Jero said just before we move on to uh, other questions? Sure. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, acknowledge that some of the, the, those uh, issues that Gerard uh, flung up are, are definitely thorny around actually, you know, having to work out how to address climate with a, a definition of ecocide. But I think that something that, that, that is often perhaps, I don't know, maybe glossed over or not, not discussed is the fact that, you know, climate change is ultimately a symptom of which many decades of direct serious destruction of ecocides uh, sorry, serious destruction of ecosystems, in other words, serious ecocide over decades, is a root cause. Um, and so, you know, we can reduce emissions as much as we like, but if we're continuing to destroy ecosystems and habitats at the rates that we're seeing, you know, that's, you know, we're destroying carbon sinks and we're directly, you know, the, the, those, those things directly interplay with each other. And at the moment, the, the, the conversation about climate internationally is almost exclusively focused on emissions. Um, and that is a great shame because um, the, 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 the biodiversity and ecology side of this equation is absolutely key. Um, and so, you know, we believe that whatever emerges ultimately as, you know, in terms of the definition and how well or how much it can, it can address directly climate change, it will be addressing climate change because those direct, those direct harms have a direct effect on the climate situation. So yeah, that, that, was, my, that was my key thought. Jérôme, veux-tu répondre à ça ou... Jérôme, do you want to answer that? Or... I don't know if you're looking for your microphone or ignoring me. No, she asked, uh, do you want to respond to that? Sorry. Uh, I, had, I had a blank. Sorry, I, mean, I, I was. Uh, I had a blank suddenly. No, actually, I just wanted to make one comment here. I believe that beyond the question of the ecocide, there is an issue that is uh, uh, an environment aside is a, a climate aside it's a problem when i had the project of a world packed on environment it's difficult to add bricks 
uh, or intersectoral brick or transversal brick in this environmental law. While we built an, our environmental law on things that are pretty fragmented and, and not unified enough. I like the idea of uh, the, the separa a separate treaty in which there will be some criminal uh, issues because that would allow us to better capture the diversity of situations of prejudice to the environment and i'm afraid that uh, a criminal just a criminal indictment w could just encapsulate all those problems so there's also a danger a strategic danger which is to uh, provide a broad criminal uh, uh, power would give more power to judges and might not be uh, likely to be accepted by the legislators so what is the power we want to give to judges compared to power gives to others and to the states and i keep the states want, we want to keep more power in the uh, negotiated treaty uh, compared at, with making a short and brief uh, incrimination with an important transfer of powers to judges and then might be a problem of democratic legitimacy that would be difficult to influence the work of the judge on how to work on interpretations and qualifications what uh, Gerard just asked um, and I think that w the way that we see uh, ecocide crime is as um, is not by any means something that's going to fix everything but as something that can bridge um, you know and, and in a sense sort of adding you know one extreme and well-defined crime to a document at the international level is is it has, has the ability to kind of potentially open up the arena for what might well emerge in term, in, in the longer term, something like an ecocide treaty, which can be more nuanced and can be more, um, you know, can, can have, can cover a lot more um, and, you know, it, potentially some sort of more um, areas of, of kind of attitude towards how we deal with with the environment and so on um but the the reality is that um currently i mean as i understand it you know there's been a kind of uh, crimes against humanity convention sort of languishing on a back shelf for some time now um and the global pact for the environment that was uh, you know aimed at uh, from from france and had its first major meeting i think last year had real trouble you know getting anywhere past starting blocks so one of the things that we see about you know this particular intervention is that one's not starting from scratch one is potentially amending a document that's already in place and therefore it's quite a, a sort of uh, the procedurally it's relatively straightforward as opposed to potentially trying to recruit from the beginning you know a whole um you know international consensus um and and you know i have to say that in this particular regard it's not necessarily a bad thing that the us uh, Russia and China are not members of the ICC because they can't then get in the way of moving that amendment forward, which they would certainly could potentially do um, in the case of starting a new treaty from scratch. So that, that, that that's that's a few just a few thoughts in in response to that. Yeah, this this maybe brings me to one crucial issue, which I which which is central, and you know the the strategy of trying to amend a own statute. Uh, has this one consequence. The International Criminal Court only has jurisdiction over physical persons, individuals. However, we know that main, like a lot of the ecocide linked crimes, let's call it this way, are committed by either corporations or state entities. Uh, the idea, I suppose, is to also not only punish, but also deter the commission of ecocide crimes. So I'm wondering what you could have to say about about that and how would the inclusion within the Rome Statute would contribute to deter ecocide considering that it has a limitation in its jurisdiction to physical persons. So, Jojo, you want to start? Definitely. I mean, for us, this is one of the key uh, benefits of uh, criminalizing at the, at the International Criminal Court, because, and particularly with ecocide, where the kinds of activities that we're aiming to aiming at are mostly in, in the realm of corporate practice. Um, I mean, if you're a war criminal or, God forbid, a genocidal maniac, you may not really care too much what your public image is. Um, if you're a corporate CEO, you care very deeply because your, your share price, your stock value, your investor confidence and public confidence depend directly on it. So if, if your personal freedom and reputation is on the line, that that's in the context of the corporate world, that's potentially a very powerful deterrent, perhaps more so than in the case of the other crimes. So and, and, and you know, it, it's, it's been found that, you know, when you change regulation, you tend to change corporate budgeting. You know, you, you, they, they might sort of set aside 
more funds for court cases or for compensations um, or, or for you know, expensive lawyers to get around those regulations potentially. Um, but when you criminalize something, you've got a much better chance of actually changing behavior because that's a personal responsibility that comes in there. Daryl, go ahead. Uh, I agree with Jojo and I'll ask, also add, um, yeah, the ICC doesn't directly um, convict corporations just because they couldn't agree at the time. But I don't think it's a big problem because the board of directors, the president of the CEO, all those others, they're human beings and the ICC can prosecute the humans involved. So um, I, I think it's still uh, viable. Jérôme, do you want to add something to this topic? It's not my field of expertise specifically. Of course, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are a company-based problem, but uh, physical persons could also be sued. It's more a question that I would share here, because it's not my field, uh, penal, uh, criminal international law. I was asking about complicity. How do you manage complicity? Because in the decision of a climatocidal project, uh, there's a person who initiated the problem. There are people who made impact studies. There are people who read, read those impact studies and approved them. Uh, there are many deputy ministers who have given authorizations. There's also a minister who gave authorizations. And the governor and council here in Canada, Matt have given his authorization. Ultimately, it's if a tar sand project. If you don't have, uh, if you have an electric car, if we still put gas in our car, we're also complicit in a way. Way. Uh, I'm asking myself, how do we manage this question, which brings us to another debate, which is uh, the, 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 the division between national and international crimes. Lisa, did you want to jump in? Uh, I mean, oh, this yeah, is sorry. such a full, fulsome discussion. There's so many different directions we can go in. Um, uh, maybe just a, a brief follow up and it's a little bit of a philosophical one, but it's a concern that's been raised and this is a question that can go to any one of the panelists about risks around the creation of hierarchy of harms when it comes to uh, environmental harm. So just maybe wondering about reflections on concerns that have been raised that, you know, by setting a standard at the international level where ecocide is seen as uh, an international crime. Um, is there a risk that anything less than that, anything less than ecocide could be considered not that bad? Um, I don't know who might want to, to reflect on that. Maybe Jojo will start. And no, I mean, I have um, to say, I, I, I think we kind of um, touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, I certainly did. I actually feel that the, the, the opposite is likely to be true in the sense that I think that at the moment, um, if you, if you, the environmental re environmental regulation environmental law generally is simply not given the same weight as um, other kinds of crimes and so criminalizing something at the highest level has the likelihood of kind of shifting that a bit and actually in aim aiming to enhance the um the the enforcement of lesser regulations so i actually think it's li literally the, the the opposite and the other, and i just wanted to come back very briefly on what actually on what um uh, Giro was saying uh, before as well um around um I, it occurs to me that you know we we've been as as a as a as citizens we've we've had a kind of swindle perpetrated on us over the last 20 years by the corporate PR machine to an extraordinary degree to the extent that you know we're basically all being told look it's all your fault you're all consumers you're all demanding these things and and you know you need to look at your carbon footprints and and you know you need to, to take individual action because you know it's, it's all ultimately down to all of us isn't it well that's not a reality I mean if you think about you know I, I live in a rural area so I have a car it's a fossil fuel car not because I want it to be but because I can't afford anything else. Um, and that's not a decision I made. That's a decision that was made in terms of who's subsidized, you know, who's, you know, where, where are the, where's the lobbying happening at the top level? So, you know, the, there's, there's a way in which kind of aiming at that top level and at those in, individuals actually, you know, makes a lot of sense in the kind of bigger picture of, you know, where, where that responsibility lies. You know, we're not all, we're not just consumers, we're citizens and we're given certain options. Um, so yeah, anyway, that was a, a, an aside on the other subject. <laughs> Daryl? 
Uh, I think Jojo crushed it, but I guess I can add one thing is um, the Rome Statute also has Article 10, which says, listen, just because we've defined these extra awful war crimes and crimes against humanity and genocide, it doesn't mean that everything else is okay. So that, that appears in Article 10 of the ICC statute. Perhaps that provision could be amended or referred to in some way. I, I've noticed that in the work I did on ecocide is I think it is important to have something saying we are making a really stringent, low, high thresholds cr crime. That is not a license, right? It's not a license to do everything else. And I, I agree with Jojo that I think it'll be momentum enhancing rather than um, uh, sucking up all the oxygen. Um, I'll, I'll ask you last questions from us, uh, I suppose, which is sort of dual, has two aspects to it. And then we'll move to the questions um, that uh, some of the questions that were asked by, um, by the audience. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, I think at, at different levels, I think Giro, at the end, you, you finished on this, is the impact of the creation of an international crime of ecocide at the national level. Uh, you know, obviously we know for some of us that the International Criminal Court is founded on this complementarity issue, which means that technically if you ratify the, the Rome Statute and eventually the amendment on ecocide, you would uh, criminalize the crimes of the Rome Statute in your own law. You could create jurisdiction. We've mentioned really quickly, Daryl, universal jurisdiction. So I'm wondering if you could just really tackle really quickly, what impact do you think it would have at the national level? So, so you mentioned uh, some states have already criminalized uh, the crime. I think France just did a daily decocide, which was a bit, but so would, do you think that would, yeah, I know it's not a, a perfect victory, but I mean, it, it, my, my point is, what would it, you think it has an impact on the the criminal uh, aspect in national law. And my second question linked to that is what should Canada's role be? Um, you mentioned at the very beginning, Lisa, Canada as being a champion for a technique for international justice and human rights, at least it prides itself in saying this. Uh, where is Canada in this debate? Has it been there? I hope we have people come from the justice department that is with us, that are with us. What, what, what should we do at the, at the grassroots level here to ensure that Canada plays a significant role uh, in this uh, larger debate. So whoever wants to take the floor first. I'm happy to take that, yeah. last, that last part first, I suppose. And uh, I think I'll leave the, the, more, the more sort of criminal law aspects to, uh, to Dow perhaps. Um, but um, in terms of uh, Canada, I mean, well, what we would, we would hope from Canada as we hope from, from um, any country that is engaging in this conversation is to declare at whatever level um, we, you know, that, that it supports, it would support an international crime of ecocide. Um, you know, we believe that that's not a particularly difficult thing politically to be able to, to be able to say. Um, and it, 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 it also has an implication of, you know, we can see this coming. And I think this is really important, the fact that people can see this coming. So when, we, when you say, what can, what can we do in Canada? What can we do anywhere? Is talk about this. You know, talk about ecocide, use ecocide as a word to describe serious damage and destruction. Keep, you know, make make the conversation, you know, so that nobody can ignore that conversation. Um, because it, it is a question of people need to think about this. And they are actually, I mean, some of the conversations that we're starting to have now with NGOs, with the corporate sector, with you know, a whole bunch of different people is around the fact that, you know, this is something that is approaching. And in fact, even insurance companies, I mean, in fact, I think it was a, re a reinsurance company that Polly Higgins had a conversation with a few years ago. Um, I think it was someone from Lloyd's of London. And they said, look, we know something like this is coming. It's just a question of when. You know, so what so that that whole conversation, bringing that to life and saying, OK, this is something that is being defined now, it's being considered, it's going to be in discussion, et cetera, et cetera, just stimulates those kinds, that kind of thinking that we need, that people are saying, OK, so, you know, we may be seeing this parameter coming into play. I mean, we see it as a kind of a guardrail, if you like, you know, a kind of a course correction and, and, and a steer to sort of send things in the right direction and, and a good a large part of the power of that is seeing that coming and having those conversations that, you know, long before it actually ends up in the black letter of the law, it's going to be, it's already starting to make a difference. Daryl? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, yeah, uh, Canada made, there was some comment Canada made about where we will watch with interest the ecocide definition come out and uh, 
Uh, you know, sorry. I think sometimes Canada can't, I apologize to every government person on this chat, love you all, but uh, uh, Canada's position often on things is we're sitting on the fence, sitting on the fence, sitting on the fence, and I, I kind of miss the 90s Canada where Canada led stuff, and we have a liberal government that uh, uh, claims to care a lot, well, and there's a lot of en en um, evidence that they do care a lot about climate change, and Canada's been a leader on international criminal law, so my hope would be that Canada will, once the definition's out, Canada will come off the fence and and, uh, and be uh, uh, one of the strong supporters like in the old days. Um, and then on national prosecutions, Fanny's question, I completely agree. Um, I, I think that's the most important thing, more important than ICC prosecutions, which will be so limited. And yeah, right now, every state is scared to pass legislation, especially extraterritorial legislation, because if your definition you, you're kind of going out on thin ice, right? Whereas if we create an international definition, then states can implement it and it can probably be become custom uh, pretty quickly. So uh, I, I see it as uh, definitely I want lots of national prosecutions. I also think there's a... I also think there's a breadth that is possible as a result of that in the sense that, I mean, you just pull an example out of the air. I mean, let's say you've got a, I don't know, a US company that's committing ecocide in, I don't know, Venezuela, and it has happens to have an operational office in Belgium. Belgium, as we know, is at the moment a front runner in this discussion, let's say, and it's also had a rep, got a reputation for potentially operating universal competence or universal jurisdiction. Um, you know, if Belgium ratifies this crime, a company officer could then be prosecuted in Belgium. So effectively, you, you know, you're looking at the sort of expanding the potential for, you know, where prosecutions can happen and, and, and how they can happen. Lisa? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. I just wanted to um, come back to some of the questions in the chat and also just just remind uh, all of us that this is this is the start of the conversation and we're really hoping um, that we will focus on some of these huge issues but we'll pick up on the discussion at a, at a future event um, but I just wanted to come back to there are one or two questions coming in from the chat um, that are kind of linked to this notion of human harm so from uh, Patty, question directed to Jojo, is it helpful to think of ecocide as an enforcement mechanism for the right to life? Or is it not imaginative to think of it in this human focused way? And there are one or two other questions uh, focused on human health. And I know this has been part of the discussion uh, when it comes to the definition, is the focus strictly on harm to the earth and that having that real paradigm shift um, or can this be kind of an all encompassing things because after all these are very much intricately linked. Jojo, do you want to? to yeah, start? I'm happy, happy to take that. I'm sure that the others will have thoughts on this as well. I mean, you know, we, we very much hope that, that, you know, that what emerges from this, this sort of drafting exercise will be something that is not restricted to human harm, um, that, that there therefore can take into account harm that happens to ecosystems regardless of, you know, whether it's also human harm. Um, I think the, the, the question around the, uh, the, the right to life thing is an interesting one because we often get asked about the relationship between um, the ecocide movement and the movement for the rights of nature. Um, and I mean, the way that we often think of this is that the sort of rights discourse and the criminal law one are kind of two sides of a coin. So, you know, I mean, obviously the basic human right is the right to life, but that right to life is protected by criminal law. It's protected by the fact that, you know, killing someone is a crime. Um, and so in a way we see ecocide as a kind of complement to the rights of nature movement in the sense that, you know, the ecocide could potentially protect the rights of nature. Um, and, and, in, and indeed, the, the, I mean, the, the rights of nature movement is actually now quite um, répandu, you know, well, I can't even remember the English word for that, across the world now um, at the grassroots level. Um, and, but it kind of, it, I mean, it kind of represents an even stronger shift in mentality than ecocide crime does, because it, it requires like the whole legal system to uh, acknowledge that, you know, not humans are, are not the only subject of rights. And obviously, you know, we, we know that corporations currently are as well, but it all sort of can be treated as, as legal persons. But, um, and, and so we see sort of ecocide almost as a kind of um, something that could slightly shift the mentality towards more broadly you know accepting that that you know rights bearing subjects don't have to be human um so so yeah it's kind of interesting there's a complementary relationship there 
Jérôme Oui, uh, sur la... Yes, sur la... yes. About the, the question that has just been asked, that refers us to the question, what is the value that is protected by this crime of ecocide? And uh, this is a question I asked myself too. And uh, by consulting the work that was done by Professor Laurent Meret in France, this is one of the questions on which they debated a lot, is the value that we want to protect here, is nature for itself or is it uh, the human being as a user of the nature? And that debate is important because if we consider that both values are to be protected at the same time, we can come to conflicts in objectives and purposes in the assumption that we have an invasive species, which is harmful to men or to, to, to human beings. Those are not two futuristic scenarios. Those are cases that we could actually be confronted with. Would it be an ecocide uh, to control, eradicate, suppress, uh, kill uh, members of a species, uh, knowing that this species is harmful to human beings and uh, uh, is uh, life-threatening? Those are more philosophical issues. But uh, for, uh, be, without being a criminal law expert, the value to be protected is a very important in the definition of a crime. And there will be a clear choice to be made here too. And if it's included in the Statute of Rome, uh, that might be an important difference compared to other uh, types of incriminations because incriminations, in most incriminations, the value to be protected is the individual and not anything else external to the individual. I, um, I, um, I asked uh, John Packer, who's a member of our partnership and who has been following the discussion closely, to perhaps uh, take the floor and ask uh, his question. Are you there, John? And could you uh, ask your question, please? I think it was directed at Jojo. Maybe everyone can respond. Hi, yeah. it's a pleasure to have you with us. Me. Nice to see everyone and uh, congratulations on this initiative and, and those who uh, are driving this forward. I think it's a very important topic. I'm just thinking, uh, I think there was another question also by Richard uh, from Global Affairs, um, where the state is sanctioning uh, what are evidently massive environmental damages, but justify them by uh, compelling and normally considered sovereign rights, for example, over national security or defense. And I'm thinking uh, very specifically, concretely, uh, how Iraq justified the draining of the southern marshes in the early 1990s, which you know is one of the 10 uh, most important freshwater areas in the world, uh, largest biodiversity in the entire Middle East. Uh, but their invocation was uh, national security. And you know they had a pretty fair argument. They'd been attacked by Iran, had an eight year war uh, and so forth. So, so should we maybe be thinking about this also a little bit more like the genocide convention? Uh, where there's a state responsibility uh, in that case to protect identifiable groups? Is there a state responsibility to, uh, to protect or preserve identifiable or not, not cause uh, uh, specific and uh, serious environmental harm uh, so that it doesn't create the problem of essentially sanctioning and protecting private actors or the state as such? Uh, by the way, this also connects with another question someone asked about reparation, because of course, you know, one of the great shortcomings, if I may say, of international criminal law is virtually no, no meaningful reparation. And if we're talking about huge, uh, you know, ecocidal uh, events, then I think we should be talking about some kind of uh, uh, serious repair. So I'd be curious to know how, how the panelists respond to this. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll take the, the, the last part of that first, um, which is, um, that obviously the the reparation side and and potentially restoration um are some those are aspects that would need to come into play at the you know obviously at the level of of sentencing and right now we i sort of feel like we kind of almost haven't got that far <laughs> in terms of um you know where where we've got to with this discussion in terms of the drafting and the, and the legal side of just looking at, at the moment at the defining the actual crime um but i certainly would would hope to see and i know polly higgins would have was absolutely you know adamant on this that 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 uh, the sentencing for destruction of ecosystems should absolutely include uh, reparation and restoration uh, of some kind. Um, and I think that there, but there are also some interesting possibilities that are kind of popping up in other areas. For example, um, there's a group that's looking at kind of conservation litigation um, and how, you know, 
crimes against um you know wildlife you know threatened species and so on you know could potentially also trigger you know as as part of that that um litigation process you know trigger reparations as part of and restoration as part of the um the response to that so i think that is an area that is currently kind of under examined but it's not it's, it's already in in some litigation cases is already possible there are mechanisms but they're not really being used so i think that's going to be a, a kind of quite a sort of growth area of investigation and and discussion um and in regard to the the earlier question about the um you know the, the national laws and so on i think i mean for me this speaks to you know whether you're looking at ultimately defining the crime by how much harm it causes um and that's i think i mean my personal my personal preference around this would would be um would be that in the sense that obviously we don't really know from now to three years time what ecocidal activities will have been dreamed up um but if we're saying the, you know if we, we look at our definitions of terms and you know what is severe damage what is long-term damage you know it, it, it's like those should be potentially the criteria so that you, you may not it's not necessarily the how or the why it's what what it what it's actually doing in terms of harm and i think that potentially can can um, can go quite some way to addressing um, your question john Jerome, go ahead i think it Jero, is. Well, and I, I, it was oh Jero. <laughs> no, I actually, I, I apologize because I think there's a nuance in John's question and I wasn't getting it. So I will just go to the back of this slide. Um, sur, uh, sur About la reparation, in 2018, there was an important breakthrough at the International Court of Justice, which was their reparation of the ecological prejudice in the Costa Rica Nicaragua affair and there's a certain signal there it's possible in a litigation in international litigation to declare uh, uh, ecological damage we can discuss the method that was used I understood that the uh, International Criminal Court doesn't uh, make a statement on that but the main problem is not so much the obligation of to repair but to measure what is to be repaired because I had a session about climate change I come back to this a company that emits a lot of greenhouse gas. What is exactly the damage that can be attributed to that company? And we get into the controversy on the question of cost to effect relationship and extent of damage, which are extremely compared. The criminal court of justice position, although it's evolved, is that this should be a sufficiently direct cost to effect relationship between the illicit international fact and the damage so that uh, the, the repair could happen because of that fact. I don't know exactly what form it could take, but we could absolutely decide that reparation will not be on the basis of a damage that was actually measured but on some other basis that will be up to us jurists to propose alternatives i don't have the answer there again but we don't have to think only about the word damage in order to get repair have a reparation could i just push a bit uh, um daryl i guess uh, because uh, thank you for those responses uh, uh, Gerard and uh, jojo um, but the, the reparation side for me is is less important than the first part of my question, which is, um, you know, I agree with Daryl's proposition that it will be rare that an individual sets out to commit massive ecocide <laughs> uh, or or has a cap capability to do so. Uh, and so there it's we're either talking about probably corporations or we're talking about governments themselves, actually. Uh, in terms of the real kind of scale and reach. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand the intersection here with state responsibility. And by the way, to go to reparation, you know, uh, for example, uh, to my understanding, under international criminal law, there's quite a significant absence of, uh, let me say, provi effective provisional measures or reparations. I mean, no, no individual is going to repair uh, the kind of things we're talking about. So, um, I'm just curious about this intersection with states. I'm kind of thinking the Genocide Convention might be a more appropriate or at least complementary paradigm. You kind of have to have both, is my sense. Uh, yes, and I'm glad you clarif clarified because I, I knew I wasn't fully uh, getting your question. That's great. Um, Yes, first of all, I think ecocide is very typically going to be committed by either corporations or by states. And that's one of the 
failings of criminal law, by the way, criminal law everywhere focuses on the acts of little people, um, you know, regular people and not the acts of the powerful, um, you know, states and corporations, right? In fact, things that states and corporations do tend not tend to get even defined away as not even criminal when in fact, objectively, you know, it's the same uh, principles. So um, yes, absolutely. It has to cover state actors. And I agree about state responsibility. If um, ecocide is uh, the most serious forms of environmental harm, then I think almost every act of ecocide will also be an international um, wrong, an international wrongful act, giving rise to state responsibility, just like genocide is both a crime and also generates uh, state responsibility. I, I, was, I, was, I wasn't sure if I was seeing your body language, Jojo, if you wanted to add anything, but uh, this is one of the, the downsides of Zoom. The body language is difficult to read. Um, we're about to wrap up. Um, I know that uh, Christina Borelli, you wrote uh, quite a number of questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to take the floor if you're uh, connected. If not, I can try. I think you were concerned about Venezuela particularly and just reacted to this uh, question. So I would uh, just uh, ask you, uh, have the benefit to ask the last questions if you're, if you're there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, along the same lines as I'm trying to get my video on, along the same lines as um, what John Parker was was uh, talking about with Iraq. In the case of Venezuela, you know, it's it's the actual regime and it's 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 individuals at the head of the Venezuelan government who are promoting this ecocide and the the, the illegal gold mining in you know, protected areas in um, uh, World Heritage sites. Uh, it's it's open. Um, it's unbelievable. So, you know, there, I guess it's an intersection of, you know, uh, people, but it's also state um, driven. And, uh, you know, how, how does that sort of work into all of this? Because it's to me, it's not entirely clear. I, I, I got, um, you know, I get Jojo's point about how this law will, would protect um, governments and the safety and numbers or whatever, but you know, when, when the roles are reversed, how does that work? Yeah, go ahead, sorry, yeah, the good yeah, I'm, 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 you, I'm, sure, I'm sure the others will have something to say too, but um, I'd say that, I mean, this is in a way precisely where the ICC comes into its own. What it's there for is to actually hold the highest levels of, you know, state decision making, uh, you know, uh, to, to remove the impunity at that level. And just I'll just give the example of the, the filing that was made earlier this year against Jair Bolsonaro um, at the ICC for crimes against humanity um, by Chief Rowney from Brazil through the French lawyers. Um, William Bourdon and his uh, colleagues, um, and and he was it would the, the accusation was of crimes against humanity. But in fact, Chief Rowney was very clear that he actually what he wanted to accuse him of was ecocide. Um, and actually, had there been a law of ecocide in place, that filing might well have happened earlier. But he had to have enough evidence of crimes against humanity, which literally was, were resulting from the ecocide, in order to make that filing. Um, but I think that that sort of shows very much that you know that that's kind of what the ICC is there for as a court of last resort. You know, it's it, it in the sense that when a state can't or won't prosecute, which of course is the state is the perpetrator is not going to, then that's precisely where the ICC becomes most useful. Um, I agree, and um, I'll also add, um, yeah, uh, international criminal law uh, very much focuses on state actors. It doesn't overlook them, and th that's the case with genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Aggression has to be a state actor, so with e ecocide, we certainly would be looking at state actors. And also, um, to touch on something that came up in the um, chats as well, people were talking about the north-south dimension, that the ICC for example, is tended to focus on the global south. I see that as a possible benefit of ecocide because ecocide is a crime where the perpetrators are, as the corporate perpetrators are often in the north. The harms of ecocide are felt in the south. So I see this as a possible corrective in that uh, the kind of equity or injustice. Jérôme, did you want to add something? I didn't want to cut you. Uh, uh,
Non, enfin, well, non, j'avais beaucoup well, de questions. Actually... Excusez-moi. Sorry, yeah. I was thinking. Il y a vraiment beaucoup de questions. There's really a lot of questions here that come to mind at the same time. They're not all linked to the question that was asked. So, but, well, well, if you allow me, I would like to come back on a point that they all evoked earlier, which is the relationship between general international law, the responsibility of states, and uh, criminal international law. We have a lot of difficulty getting the responsibility of states on the basis of the prevention principle. We know it's uh, due diligence obligations, but we don't know how it works. It's never been tested. And I say to myself, does this mean that any indictment or incrimination will help to unblock the, the, the principle of prevention issue by saying, well, as soon as we are criminally uh, indicting a, person, a responsible act, political actor, it means that the state ipso facto is also violates this prevention principle or you know, those two separate things. And this could be really insulting for environmental law <laughs> because we could penally uh, condemn someone without <laughs> getting the responsibility of the state on the basis of violation of the principle. It would be very difficult to prove that there's a violation of the prevention principle. Sorry, I, I, I remain blocked on this question. There's this quandary of articulation about different corpuses of, of rules, but this is part of the whole scheme. But to answer maybe now the question that was asked, indeed, we should get the penal responsibility of heads of state that were uh, active when these actions were committed. I think that's where there's a link that is missing. The only way we have for Canada, for example, to, to put a barrier to those things is through uh, judicial control and administrative law. And very frankly, this is not very satisfactory. So we need something more. And in that sense, uh, criminal law is clearly uh, could pu put an additional limit when decide decision makers make decisions. Thank you, Giraud. And I was going to conclude, but now Ariane Boulet, who is one of your students, asked a question which was on our list of questions at the very beginning. So I think I have to let her speak. It's central to our discussions. Ariane, thank you for asking that question because we will let you react quickly. So the question is as follows. Uh, all the issue of ecocide is, does it take into account uh, the indigenous conception of indigenous leadership in the protection of territory? So what is the place of indigenous peoples even in uh, drafting projects for the definition? It's a question which we were going to address at the end, but it's central to all the issues and we will come back to it uh, later in our next events. You can be sure, but I, I have to ask the question now to our panelists about the role of indigenous uh, people, the place, what is the place of indigenous leadership, both in the uh, design of the crime of ecocide and the drafting of the crime and what it is in its definition, as well as in the process of uh, drafting its definition and implementation. Jojo, go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a lovely question. And, and I think the, um, uh, one of the key things around um, the whole concept of an ecocide law is it, it, it actually feels like what we're trying to do is to reflect in the sort of dominant le uh, Western legal system, um, a law that is actually deeply and profoundly understood um, by the indigenous world, and that is the law of reciprocity. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not even something you make up, it's a fact you see around you. You know, you damage Mother Earth, there are consequences. Um, and in a sense, what we're precisely trying to do is, is reflect that reality, ultimately. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the deeply serious consequences of what happens when you damage Mother Earth, you know, happening rather more obviously every, every, every you know, month by month. Um, so, so there's a very sort of, we feel that kind of in the, in the sort of fundamental conception of it, we feel that it's very compatible with that. With that. Um, and then in practice, um, we've been engaging quite um, seriously with indigenous leaders over the last few months and we've actually convened a kind of um, advisory circle um, to provide some you know information in, and, and kind of thoughts and understandings and, and, and teachings around you know what might this law um, you know ha what, what should be considered you know what are the things that need to be taken into consideration from that perspective um, in the drafting of this law and what aspects you know what what sides of that could you know could enter into ultimately in, into the definition um you know whether that's in 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 definition of terms whether that's in you know in terms of what you know because one of the things that's really really striking actually in our, in our conversations um with indigenous voices has, has, has been that the, the, this complete 
um, understanding of the, the, the connectivity so that there's no, not a separate, I mean, often even the term nature isn't even used as a separate term, you know, there's, 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 there's all part of part and parcel of the web of life. Um, and so there's a kind of contextual uh, uh, element there that is really, really striking. And, you know, it's, and, and, and it's also perhaps just worth mentioning that um, there is a network of, um, uh, of, ind of indigenous leaders who are holding ceremony while the panel, the drafting panel, is having its meetings, um, which is just a phenomenal honor and, yeah, remarkable in terms of that the the, the support at, at that level that is that is there for this work. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Jérôme, um, Daryl, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I agree. And um, I was a I was a, I, I'm a new to looking at environmental law and I was sort of surprised to see how much environmental law is, uh, it really sees the, it sees this all about resource management, exploiting, uh, exploiting resources in a manageable way. So uh, it would be amazing and wonderful to inject this idea of stewardship, not only into ecocide, yes, but even more importantly into um, all of uh, environmental law. Yeah. I will just make a very quick comment on a question. It's a question that I can't uh, speak a lot, a lot about, but I would just want to uh, say something about what I observed in the environmental climate negotiations. For years, we're calling upon concepts and notions of indigenous communities uh, to conduct the climate negotiations we call upon those notions we saw this in terms in, in the durban negotiations and the paris treaty negotiations the delaloa dialogue and forum and i still see that this is an empirical just an empirical observation which is not supported by scientific facts it's really empirical but we see that this has a positive effect and a peaceful an appeasing effect on a negotiation of climate change when we call upon indigenous concepts to structure the negotiation and organize the whole negotiation. So I just share this comment because I understand that in this motion of recognition of ecocide in the status statute of Rome, there'll be a lot of discussions and procedures that will have to be put in place and using these indigenous concepts, appealing to those concepts, this culture of negotiation can have a positive in effect, even if it's delegates who have been negotiating for a lot of years and have a lot of experience. Thank you on this uh, topic. We will come back to this topic later on, and I will have to close, despite the interest for this question, by thanking you. Lisa will have the last word. And of course, we will thank our panelists. Thanks to everyone who is here on the Zoom, on the Facebook Live. Thank you for joining this discussion. I think it's a discussion that deserves to be made um, in partnership uh, with the various disciplines. Thanks for having been there from everywhere. We have people from ecological movements, people who are not jurists, non-jurists and jurists. And I think this is the broad uh, coalition that was formed here. And that allows a discussion that will be intersectoral and bring together various interests. And Jeho, I think you very well alerted us about the need to coordinate the different disciplines and functions. It's at the heart of what we're doing. Uh, thank you for raising this. I want to thank you before giving the floor to Lisa. Uh, before, I want to thank the interpreters, Mr. Louis Cazin and Ms. Kathleen Keller. Apparently, you are now uh, stars. Uh, thanks to the interpreters. And once again, I thank uh, um, everybody, Lisa and Melanie, the fabulous team of the chair at the Valley University and the Canadian Partnership, Eric Mendy, Dufresne, Eric Sullivan, Marianne Goulet, Marie Michel Pelletier from the Faculty of Law, Rachel Jasmine. You've been exceptional. Thank you very much for your impeccable organizing. You know, the partner organizations. It's a new collaboration between the Canadian Partnership for International Justice and Stopico Side Canada and the Stopico Side Foundation. It's extremely exciting. And I thank uh, everyone for their uh, great participation. And I give the floor now to my wonderful colleague, Lisa Oldring, uh, who I had a lot of pleasure organizing this with. Thank you, Lisa, you have the floor.
can only uh, echo everything you just said. Um, it's been uh, from the moment that we kind of linked arms, uh, just an absolutely wonderful collaboration with the Canadian Partnership for International Justice. So we absolutely look forward to uh, picking up and carrying this forward. And uh, again, just warm thank you to Jojo and Daryl and Jill for uh, such a full discussion. And it's just given us a great base to, to take forward. We've put in the, the chat the link if, um, people are interested to the Stop Ecoside Canada website where you can sign up to the newsletter for anybody who wants to kind of follow events and developments um, from here on but we'll certainly be in touch uh, really grateful for the really active participation from from everybody today so warm thanks and all the best and we look forward to the next step have a good day everyone <laughs>